Exhibit 4 is a public safety assessment, and Exhibit 5 is a criminal history for this defendant. I offer them for purposes of this hearing. All right, let me just uh, focus on S, <coughs> excuse me, S3, Mark for Identification. That is a um, temporary restraining order that is under FE03-1656-20. Is that the one uh, that you're referring to, sir? Yes, Your Honor, I believe it is. Um, okay. And appears to be dated April the 3rd, 2020, signed by Judge McInerney. That would be correct, Judge. Okay, very good. Mr. Rizzo, S1234 and 5, sir. No objection. Your Honor. Any objection? No, sir. No objection? Okay. That's one, two, three, four, and five are admitted in evidence. May I proceed, Judge? Yes, ready, ready uh, for your presentation, sir. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as the court can see from Exhibit 1, this is a fourth degree contempt domestic violence charge. Um, what we see from Exhibit 2, the affidavit of probable cause and clear, is that uh, the police officer, in fact, the same police officer that the court will see in Exhibit 3 that served this defendant with a restraining order at around 5.30 p.m., um, observed this defendant two hours later outside of the protected party's residence. Uh, the defendant at that time, uh, per the affidavit of probable cause, claimed that he was bringing food um, and was going to do a few things. I believe he mentioned, per the probable cause statement, that he was bringing pizza. Uh, at that time, the defendant was arrested. The complaining witness and protective party stated that he was uh, sleeping uh, outside uh, for a portion of there. Uh, I would note the complaining witness did concede that the defendant at that time was not being aggressive or threatening at that time. Um, as we see from the clear, the uh, encounter was recorded by body-worn camera and also observed by the, uh, by the police officer. We then look at the restraining order itself, and I think this goes to both uh, probable cause to uh, detain this individual as well as uh, to certain strengths of the case. Um, we see that the reason for the restraining order is a uh, verbal altercation that resulted in allegations that this defendant slashed uh, three of the complaining witnesses' uh, spouses' tires, and she then threw uh, clothing out of the house saying that she wanted him out of the house. That incident occurred on April 2nd. It is noted um, as a complaint summons as a pending charge on the public safety assessment. We note from Exhibit 3 that this defendant, um, the, the box is marked as a history of past domestic violence assault on the first page, but we don't see any detail as it relates to it. Um, what we do see on the latter page is that, and I mentioned this earlier, was the defendant was served um, on uh, April 4th uh, at around 5.30 p.m. Um, we also see that uh, from the first page there was allegations that the defendant uh, stated that if I can't have you, no one can on the April 2nd incidents. So then we go to um, the public safety assessment. And the public safety assessment ranks this defendant as a 4-5, no release recommended. Um, we see that he has... Um, a criminal mischief and a simple assault um, charge pending. Um, we see that he has indictable matters uh, for in Ocean County for assault by auto. I would note that that is not a, uh, noted as a domestic violence matter, uh, but rather an incident where he was driving while intoxicated and there was a, a motor vehicle collision at that time. What we do see is prior disorderly persons convictions for uh, contempt, albeit in 2002, two uh, theft by unlawful taking and drug-related offenses. But what's particularly concerning here is the defendant also has indictable. He has two robberies, two burglaries, three thefts, and uh, one in drug and one identity theft indictable. We see that, sure, he has fairies to appear in his past, four, but they're from two of which are from 2010 and one is from 2009, one is from 2008. But what we also know is, is that from 2010 uh, to, uh, well, uh, he did serve uh, various amounts of jail time um, in the past 20 years as well. Um, so what we have here is an individual who, per the criminal history, Exhibit 5, has eight indictable convictions, four violations of probation, 
five parole violations. In short, Your Honor, he has a history of noncompliance. Um, juxtaposing that with the allegations in the instant offense, he served with the order of protection, and two hours later, he's found violating it. We see that he is uh, at a risk for failure to appear because he doesn't apply with conditions. Um, he um, has serious issues um, with obstructing the judicial process and not, uh, not abiding by conditions of probation and parole, um, and also um, appearing for court, as well as presenting a danger uh, to the community and in, in particular the protected party. Um, as the court and counsel are aware, a restraining order is a piece of paper, but the expectation is upon service, a citizen would um, choose to litigate that uh, in a proper forum, not uh, violate it and um, incur further charges as the defendant did here. Um, based on all this, Judge, the, the state submits there's no condition the court can craft based on this defendant's uh, history, based on um, that would abate the condition that he would apply with conditions, that he would be amenable to pretrial release, that he would appear for court, and that he wouldn't uh, present that danger, uh, in particular to the protected party. With that, the state would submit. Thank you very much. Mr. Rizzo, any response? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. I think it's important to consider the facts uh, surrounding the um, current charge, Your Honor, which the prosecutor has already uh, explained to the court. And that is that my client had just recently been served with the uh, the order. Uh, he went to pick up things. Uh, he should have uh, asked for a police escort, which he did not. Uh, he was bringing a pizza uh, as a sign of goodwill, I guess. Um, however, the uh, the lady involved, his wife, stated that uh, at no time had he uh, been aggressive toward her during that uh, period of time that consists of the, that constitutes the contempt violation. Uh, and the police also noted in their uh, probable cause statement that he was not aggressive with the police, which I think is highly significant. As in far, I'm sorry, in terms of his background, uh, he's a 44-year-old gentleman. He's been married for three years. They don't have any children. He has a GED. Uh, he, can, he completed cosmetology school. He was studying to become a barber and actually did work as a barber uh, at one point in time. I think it's very significant to take into account a very responsible and complete and thorough work history that he has. At the time uh, of his arrest, he had just been uh, furloughed, I guess you'd call it, by uh, ShopRite. He had been working there for uh, several months and was due to accept an offer that they made to him to uh, take a butchering course to uh, promote him in their uh, organization. Um, before that, he worked for the ex barber shop, which is right next to that shop, right? And he, he had been there for two years working as a barber. Before that, he lived up in Pasea County. He worked for a supermarket there known as Corrado's for a period of a year. And before that, he worked for a tire company, ben, uh, Beningo's uh, Tires, uh, and he worked there for a 14 year period. Um, he tells me that he completed a uh, successfully completed a uh, drug court program in Burlington County. Uh, which he finished in January, um, and as the prosecutor pointed out, uh, his work, his uh, violation history seems to be uh, in good part fairly remote. So, given all that, Your Honor, and given the fact that he spent a couple of day days in jail to bring home the message to him uh, right now that he's uh, not to come anywhere near the uh, wife's residence, I think it would be sufficient uh, for the court to release him on a monitoring program that will both assure his uh, compliance with monitoring, assure his compliance with the court order not to be around his wife, and will assure his future uh, appearances in court, as well as uh, making sure that he does not commit any further offenses. Okay, thank you, sir. Any response from the state? Mr. Remy, um, are I'm, you I'm, muted? Now, now I'm, okay, now I'm not muted. Um, okay, go ahead, sir. Any response from the state? Uh, yes, Your Honor. The defense poses this argument as, well, he was just served. Now, um, there may be some ambiguity uh, if he was never never in the system as a domestic violence offender uh, or that he never had, you know, not known about the conditions of the order of protection. But what we see from the public safety assessment is this defendant does have prior um, orders of protection and a domestic violence history in his past. In point of fact, he also was convicted of disorderly persons uh, contempt in the past. 
So the situation that the defense poses is a bit different uh, than what his client's history um, reflects, which is he knows that when he's served with an order of protection, he needs to abide by the conditions or he faces penalty. And he, the penalty he does face is a fourth degree conviction, which can carry uh, certain penalties associated with it. Uh, it also doesn't um, make the condition of the danger uh, presented as well as the uh, risk of him failure to appear and obstructing the judicial process. I would otherwise rest on the uh, record submitted. Thank you, sir. Any final word, Mr. Rizzo? Very well. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. This is the uh, pretrial detention uh, uh, hearing for Mr. James Carfora. Uh, the state has filed a motion for pretrial detention, and we've had the hearing. First of all, the court does find probable cause for the offense. We know that probable cause is a well-grounded suspicion that an offense has been committed. And based on exhibits S2 and S3, the court does have a well-grounded suspicion that an offense has been committed. We need to keep in mind that probable cause requires far less evidence than is needed to convict at trial. We did not have the trial today. At trial, the state has the burden of proving each and every uh, element of the offense beyond a reasonable doubt. That will come later. That's not today. Uh, but the court does find probable cause for the offense. Uh, the court also finds by clear and convincing evidence that there is no amount of uh, uh, monetary bail, non-monetary conditions, or combination of bail and conditions that would reasonably assure this defendant's appearance in court when required, and or the protection of the safety of any other person or the community, and or that the defendant would not obstruct or attempt to obstruct the criminal justice process. The court is primarily concerned with the protection of the safety of other persons in the community, particularly the safety of the victim in this case. Uh, the court finds that the state has established by clear and convincing evidence the need for pretrial detention in that the uh, court has a firm belief or conviction as to that uh, need uh, that the truth of the allegations sought to be established by the evidence here is so clear, direct, and weighted and convincing as to enable the court to come to a clear conviction without hesitancy as to the truth of the facts at issue. And there are many reasons uh, for that, including the offense charge is failure to obey domestic violence restraining order. And if that was really what we had here under these circumstances without the whole entire picture, um, we might have a different conclusion. But there's so much more to this. First of all, uh, particular circumstances are after assaulting his wife, defendant was served with a temporary restraining order. And if we look at um, S3, uh, it's documented, and the police are supposed to do this, and the police, I think, uh, uh, there's no indication the police did not do this uh, properly, uh, but uh, Mr. Uh, defendant, Mr. Um, uh, Carfora, was served at 5.30 p.m. on April 4th. Less than two hours later, and if you look at S2, uh, same date, April 4th, at approximately 1924 hours, and for those not familiar with military time, that is at 7.24 p.m. Uh, the police patrols responded to the same address, and there's, there's Mr. Carfor standing outside uh, the court, which is uh, the um, victim's home on that court. Uh, so 5.30 served, police are called at 7.24. So less than two hours, he's at the residence. He uh, was served, and the first thing he did was order a pizza and go right back there in absolute defiance uh, of, of the order. He knew what he was supposed to do. He knew what he was supposed to not do, and yet he posed a danger to this victim by returning immediately to the, uh, to the house after he purchased his pizza and uh, uh, supposedly went back there to get the things, quote unquote. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, also, we consider the weight of the evidence against this defendant, considering the admissibility of any evidence sought to be excluded. That includes the personal observation of law enforcement and officers who investigated. It includes the statements of the witnesses, including the victim. And there was video, there was body camera video and dash camera from the police. There was a 911 call. Uh, there was also the physical evidence, which was the temporary restraining order served on the defendant, and that's actually S3 uh, in this case. Um, the court is concerned um, with the history and characteristics of this defendant. This is a 44-year-old person who has not had good past conduct. Um, this is his 18th arrest. 18th arrest, he's been an adult um, for 26 years. Did we get that right? Um, so almost one a year, uh, just shy of one a year. And uh, this is his third domestic violence-related arrest. 
Also very significant, he has four prior violations of probation. You don't see that many, but he has four. And that shows that he's really not amenable to pretrial uh, monitoring. Uh, his criminal history is reflected in the public safety assessment and S5. And also, uh, he has some record concerning appearance at court proceedings. Um, the court is concerned with the nature and seriousness of the danger to uh, any other person or the community that would be posed by his release, particularly this defendant. Specifically, the court finds this defendant, uh, I said particularly the victim is what I should have said. The court finds specifically this defendant is a danger to continue to assault, threaten, and harm uh, property of uh, his wife and then not obey restraining orders. That's a dangerous combination. To a lesser extent, the court is concerned with the nature and seriousness of the risk of obstructing or attempting to obstruct the criminal justice process that would be posed by his release. Uh, the court specifically finds there is a potential for witness intimidation of the victim wife, uh, and this person has been his domestic violence victim in the past, uh, reference S3. Um, the release recommendation of the pretrial services program obtained using a risk assessment instrument as that release is not recommended. The public safety assessment scores are four and five, uh, and it's noted there are repeated arrests while on pretrial release. Um, as he stands before the court, this defendant uh, has, um, from day or two prior, pending domestic violence assault and criminal mischief charges with this victim. That's what led to the restraining order. That's why she needs to be protected. Uh, there's also that uh, December 21st, 2019 assault by auto case. Uh, we hear that there's alcohol involved, perhaps. And also, the overall record of a mature man, he has 18 disorderly persons convictions, includes five drug-related, uh, one domestic violence contempt, which now he's charged with that a second time uh, here, and two theft uh, charges. Actually, the one he's charged for domestic violence contempt is a, is a indictable, not a DP. And he has two theft DP charges. He also has nine indictable convictions, including two for robbery, violent, eight for, uh, three for theft, three for theft, two for burglary, one identity crime, and one for drugs. And he served seven jail sentences, um, including three years in 1997, three years in 2000, four years in 2006, and four years in 2010. Those are the bigger ones. Um, yet he's still out in public uh, posing a danger after having all of those uh, jail sentences, which uh, aggravate for, aggregate 14 years, although I'm sure he didn't serve 14 years if you added it all up. Uh, also, four failures to appear 2008-2010. That's a concern, but not a big one, um, uh, because it's been discussed what his uh, ties to the community are. The main problem is danger to the victim. Uh, to that end, this defendant has a domestic violence history. He has three prior dismissed FROs or TROs. Uh, and the court is really concerned with the defendant's ability to control his emotions and his actions, particularly in regard to this victim. Um, and combined with that, he may have unabated substance abuse problems. Um, and um, let's talk about the pizza and the, the officer, I think, was being very fair in uh, writing the probable cause statement. The officer said, well, he was not, um, what did he say? He said, um, at no time did Carrefour become aggressive or attempt to gain entry into the residence. Okay, that's good. That's, uh, he shouldn't be there in the first place. But we have to keep in mind, in domestic violence situations, the actions of bringing the victim a pizza, um, although nonviolent in and of itself, displays an attempt to maintain dominion and control over this victim. This is a common thing with domestic violence perpetrators. They will do things that seem to be innocuous or seem to be kind, have flowers delivered, send chocolates, send loving messages of some sort. But the underlying reason for that and the technique is to maintain dominion and control because the victim knows he's there, he's thinking of me, uh, um, 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 he's controlling me, I'm afraid. That's what the effect of those actions have on a domestic violence victim. So let's not get fooled by, uh, well, it's just a pizza um, in this case because she has to eat, you know, but no, that's too, and if he just had, he just had service of the domestic violence restraining order, and the first thing he's trying to do is control her once again, um, and that relates to danger to her, her feelings of, um, 
uh, isolation, hopelessness, and uh, also to maintain uh, domination and control over her. And really, somebody with this record, uh, none of his arrests, convictions, charges, jail sentences, probation, um, or parole have uh, deterred him from continuing to commit offenses. He's been, he's been through the system many times, and yet he just does what he wants to do. The victim is in danger, and the court uh, uh, is compelled to detain this individual. Uh, the court therefore finds that the state has met its uh, burden. The pre-indictment conference date is May 27th. That's been discussed. The time is at 9 a.m. The court will direct the defendant be afforded continued reasonable opportunity for private consultation with counsel. Sir, you have a right to appeal within seven days pursuant to court rule to call in 9-13. All right, good luck to you, sir. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. And we'll move on to the next case, which is Mr. DPO. Do I have anything else? I'm sorry? Do you have any excuse? Oh, Mr. Rizzo, looks like you're done, right? Because the DPL case is Mr. Glassman and the other home case is um, uh, Ms. Gottschall. So, Mr. Rizzo, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, see you, uh, see you soon, maybe for first appearances. Is, um, just to clarify, with Mr. Rizzo, President, are, are we doing 11 o'clock tomorrow or 9 o'clock tomorrow? I don't have the final word, uh, Mr. Remy. Um, I'm sure that pretrial services will send out the invitation for the uh, Zoom conference. Just check your time on that, uh, and that would probably be the authoritative um, source on that, okay? Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, gentlemen, um, well, while Mr. Carfoy is being brought over, um, I need, I need a one minute break, I'll come right back, okay? Bear with, I'll be right back. Okay, thank you everybody for your patience. We're ready to move on to the next case. And it looks like everybody is there. Um, this is the Edmundo Di Paola case, W2020-91-334 and W2020-93-334. In both matters, Mr. Di Paola has had his first appearance on separate dates. I think we're ready to proceed. May I have your appearances, please? Assistant Prosecutor Joseph Remy for the state. Good morning, Anna. Good morning, sir. David Glassman. All right, your your voice is a little jumbled there, Mr. Glassman. If you can um, adjust whatever it is you're doing. Can you make your appearance again, sir? Yes. Good morning, Judge David Glassman, on behalf of Mr. DiPiello. Thank you, sir. All right, Mr. DiPiello, uh, I notice you're standing. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. If you prefer, sir, at any time, feel free to pull a chair up to where you're standing and sit down. I don't want to make you stand uh, unnecessarily. So whatever you want to do, sit or stand, that's up to you, okay? Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, looks like we're ready to proceed, Mr. Uh, uh, Prosecutor. Yes, Your Honor. Before I begin, I, I just want to note that uh, my supervisor and an ultimate boss, Mr. Kafina, uh, is... Um, in, in attendance, um, so if I appear, why, why, you, what, what relevance? What, why do you say that? What relevance does that have? The only relevance it is is if I'm a little shaky or nervous, Judge. It's because my boss is watching, and I, I just want. Okay, all right, that's I understand. The only Thank you. Whatsoever, Judge. Okay, um, Judge. Um, we have exchanged a number of exhibits with the defense. Defense earlier uh, also agreed that the state um, has provided all discovery, or at least um, done gone to great lengths to exchange all discovery, um, and I have exchanged these exhibits uh, to the court. Um, it consists and of... Mr. Mr. Remy, I have exhibit a list of exhibits that was emailed um, from yesterday, uh, exhibits 1 through 12. Is that what you're going to uh, use? Yes, Your Honor, with the exception of I did add the additional public safety assessment uh, from the January incident and uh, noted that as exhibit 13. Okay. All right. Let's go through what you propose for exhibits, please, sir. 
Yes, Judge, Your Honor. Uh, Judge, I apologize. Uh, before before we start that, um, I do have an objection that I'd like to uh, place on the record. Um, obviously, we have to protect the record for purposes of appellate um, or even federal review. So I do have an objection initially before the prosecutor goes through that list. Well, um, what I want to do is just have Mr. Remy identify what those exhibits are, and I'll mark them for identification. Right. And then we'll go through and uh, we'll go through each one and see if you object or not. If you uh, uh, do not object, obviously it would be admitted. If you um, if you do object, we'll uh, we'll uh, decide. The court will decide after hearing uh, comments from both of you if it should be admitted or not. Okay. Right. Uh, I apologize again. My objection is grounded on a procedural um, format with regard to the hearing itself going forward. So I'd like to place that on the okay. record first, and then this okay. way uh, we'll have a uh, basis to go forward. Um, as as can, we're you, aware, can you explain what you mean by procedural format? Sure. As we're all aware, uh, there was a, board, a, a bail reform act in place before the virus. Uh, the post virus, um, the bail reform act is still in place. However. Um, there's been some changes to the Bail Reform Act. Obviously, the format, how we proceed, um, what's per, what what um, what's evidence is going to be submitted, and things like that. And what I'm trying to say is that before the for, uh, Bail Reform Act is placed, and right now, there's still an obligation for me to be able, under the Sixth Amendment, to consult with my client and to have attorney-client privilege conversations and to assess um, the situation as well as the facts and case against them. Here, that's uh, completely gone. So in other words, the Bail Reform Act, while in place, it didn't envision that particular fact. So what I'm respectfully asking the court to consider going forward is that Your Honor recognize the fact that there are some Sixth Amendment issues with regard to the right uh, of counsel as well as effective assistance of counsel, and that's been severely compromised. So I'm asking Your Honor to consider that going forward and balance that, uh, balance that fact against any efforts that the state is going to be ma make to win the issue of detention. Um, and that's the, that's what we have here. In other words, I'm not faulting the prosecutor's office for being aggressive and for doing their job, which is to prevent uh, the release of the defendant at this stage. However, what I am saying is we all as lawyers have to protect and safeguard the constitutional rights of the defendant, which are now uh, on the razor's edge of being compromised. And I'm respectfully suggesting that we have to balance that new factor as part of the bail act equation. And having participated in some of these hearings uh, in different counties, um, I don't know how they're doing this issue or what their changes they're making as they go on the fly, so to speak. But um, that's one concern I have um, have going forward. And I wanted to bring it to the court's attention so that we can at least consider it um, when evaluating what these issues are, as well as my objections. Mr. Remy, did you want to respond to this uh, argument? Well, Your Honor, obviously, I, I haven't been put on notice as it relates to this procedural objection, but I would note earlier uh, during um, this defendant's first appearance, he did state that his um, his lawyer, Mr. Glassman, had gone over the charges on the newer complaint with him. Uh, there are uh, abilities to uh, call within the jail system, uh, so the defendant isn't deprived of a meaningful opportunity to discuss the matter with counsel. Now, it may not be ideal, but I don't think any... Uh, anything in the present situation is ideal. Um, I prefer to be in my office doing my work as opposed to at home. Uh, as strange as that may sound, anybody who knows me knows that I, I actually prefer an office format. Now, I do, um, I mean, I, I, I also just want to also note that uh, for me, th this issue, and for the state, this issue isn't a matter of winning. It's obviously applying the Bail Reform Act uh, as the legislature had intended it to. Um, I, I don't see, uh, but other than that, if counsel wishes to uh, put his matter on paper, uh, affording the uh, state an opportunity to properly respond to it, the, the state will then respond more fully at that time. All right, well, thank you, gentlemen. Um, this really is a bigger issue than uh, the scope of this detention hearing is really designed to handle. We're talking about constitutional protections um, and concerns for uh, proper representation of a defendant, which is always a valid concern. Um, and why do we have back talk here? Uh, okay, I'm not talking back to we have uh, background noise. Um, the go governor has issued executive orders co um, covering a wide range of things, and also the administrative office of the court has given us guidance um, 
But none of those have really applied to this issue. Uh, it's a tougher situation uh, with people who are incarcerated, as Mr. Carfora has. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. excuse me, wrong name, Mr. DePiola has. Um, and really, there's not much the court can do as far as the um, allegation that defense counsel is hampered to properly represent his client because he doesn't have access to have um, confidential communications with the incarcerated client. And the only thing I can do to that end uh, within the authority that I have, um, uh, Mr. Glassman, because I'm not going to make any pronouncements that this is unconstitutional or anything like that, that's really up uh, to, to higher authorities than the trial level court, would be to give you additional time to see if you can get more access or more meaningful communication with Mr. De, uh, DPL. And if you want to do that, I, I'm uh, open to that um, request, which would uh, constitute an adjournment. Is that something that you'd be interested in, Mr. Glassman? Uh, Judge, uh, number one, I, I appreciate the court's accommodation. And um, if I thought it, it was uh, necessary to delay the proceedings any further, and obviously we're now on our third or fourth go around, um, I, I would take that opportunity. But I think if uh, uh, if we follow the Bail Reform Act and uh, the analysis called for uh, in that, that I can provide uh, effective counsel and, and go forward. The, the issue or and reason for the issue was not to waste the court's time. The issue was there are certain uh, offers of evidence here which affect um, knowledge that I don't have because of my inability to communicate uh, directly with the client by preserving the privilege. So what I'm saying to you is that when I make my objections to certain uh, evidence offered by the state, I wanted your honor to consider that particular fact in evaluating the validity of the objection and safeguard uh, and keep the balance, uh, for instance, um, in terms of the fact that the defendant presumed innocent at this stage. So we're ready. You're ready to proceed? Okay. I, you made it a part of the record. There's really nothing more I can do about it. And uh, we're, uh, we're ready to, um, to uh, proceed. So let's go over the exhibits. Um, hopefully, uh, Mr. Remy, you can keep with the uh, exhibit list of uh, uh, 1 through 13 that we have here. Can you uh, um, just, can you just tell us what they are uh, going 1 to 13, and then we'll go back over each and see if there are objections. Go ahead, sir. Your Honor, Exhibit 1 is Complaint Warrant Sequence Ending 91. Exhibit 2 is the Affidavit of Probable Cause and Clear for that Complaint Warrant. Exhibit 3 is Complaint Warrant Sequence Ending 93. Exhibit 4 is the Affidavit of Probable Cause and Clear from uh, that Complaint Warrant Sequence Ending 93. Exhibit 5 is a Ring video dated March 20th. 2020. Uh, exhibit 6 is a ring video da uh, dated 3 20 2020 uh, entitled Femur Break. Um, exhibit 7 is a ring video dated January 24th uh, 20. Its additional information matches the same as Exhibit 5. Uh, the content is different, um, however. Uh, as it comes from a different date. Exhibit 8 is an audio recorded interview of a nurse, Jijina, D-J-I-N-A, Johnson, standard spelling. Exhibit 9 is an interview of nurse Krissa, C-R-I-S-S-A. Exhibit 10 is a letter from a doctor. Exhibit 11 is a public safety assessment uh, from complaint warrant uh, sequence ending 91. Exhibit 12 is the criminal history for this defendant. Exhibit 13 is a public safety assessment for sequence ending 93. Okay, those are the 13 exhibits marked for identification. Mr. Glassman, uh, S1 and S2, uh, 91 warrant uh, and probable cause statement. Any objection to S, uh, uh, S1 and S2? No, sir. All right, S1 and S2 are in, in uh, evidence without objection. S3 and S4, complaint warrant and probable cause uh, uh, and plea are for uh, complaint 93. Any objection? No, sir. Okay, S3 and S4 are in evidence. Um, let's take S5, 6, and 7 ring videos uh, uh, as, as noted. Any objection to S5, 6, and 7, the ring videos? 
Uh, I simply wanted to prosecutor to confirm that the videos in question um, allegedly depict the, uh, the criminal activity that's the subject matter of the complaints, uh, and they're restricted to that. I believe the answer is going to be yes, and if that's correct, uh, we would have no objection. Uh, that would be accurate. They uh, go to probable cause as well as to strength of case. Right. Next. Uh, what, what is the purpose of the ring videos? Well, Your Honor, first of all, the state has to accomplish um, uh, initially that there's probable cause uh, for the complaints as well as to detain this defendant. Uh, in addition, uh, the, st the state uh, and the court has to weigh, uh, among other factors, uh, the nature and circumstances of the offense, the strength of the state's case, uh, and this defendant's uh, risk of exposure. Um, I know it will come up in the course of argument. Not only does the bail reform statute speak to those factors, but state versus SN um, was very critical of the fact that the state had, a, in that case, a very bare bones presentation without any uh, substantive evidence, whether it be video surveillance or additional reports. Uh, so the state is um, providing additional uh, that additional evidence here because the court has to consider that. The judge, in response, Mr. Grassman, any, any yes. response? Yes, let me indicate for the record that the issue of probable cause is really off the table because we'll stipulate to the issue of probable cause, which eliminate the need for the, Your Honor to, to make that uh, finding on the record. Um, going, uh, going further um, with regard to that, uh, that issue, uh, if, they're, if they're confined to the actual uh, event itself, um, uh, you know, then it would be in Your Honor's discretion as to whether you need that um, to supplement the description as set forth in the affidavit of probable cause or whether the complaints themselves are sufficient. Um, I assume we're going to be able to argue the merits of it. Um, I will put one, uh, one uh, um, thought uh, on the record, and that is the fact that this activity uh, is by a caregiver uh, engaged in, uh, in nursing uh, conduct on the video. And there's an interpretation to be made by the state, which they have made as evidenced by the complaints. And then there's a, 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 an interpretation given by the defendant in his statement with regard to um, uh, uh, what he was doing and whether or not it was proper. So um, I don't know if the, via, the, the viewing of the evidence is going to assist the court in that regard or not. And that's why I had, I had um, uh, considered the fact that uh, it was um, over of when necessary to prove what the uh, fire for the issue of detention. Uh, judge, if to I respond may. to what you just said, Mr. Uh, Glassman, um, first of all, you didn't tell me if you objected or not, but uh, we're not trying the case today. This is not a mini trial. It's just to see if there's probable cause. The prosecutor also mentioned a couple other reasons uh, right. for uh, admitting the exhibit. So do you object or not object? I'm leaving in the court's discretion. Okay. Uh, Mr. Remy, did you want to respond also, sir? Your Honor, first of all, uh, the state is free to accept or reject counsel stipulation. At this point, we're not accepting that stipulation. Um, as it relates to strength of case as well, counsel... Wait, you're not accepting... Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're not accepting stipulation of probable cause? That's correct, Judge. Well, how can you, how can you not accept a stipulation of probable cause? Correct. Well, Judge... What basis do you have for that? Well, Judge... In, in point of fact, Judge, it, it, it's, uh, it's actually improper to, uh, as far as I understand it, as it relates to the case law, to put a stipulation on the record unless it was discussed between the parties beforehand. But as it relates to uh, other factors that uh, counsel had raised, what he's raising, and obviously we're not here to try the case, but I think counsel is raising that, well, the state is positing, well, this is a strong case, and counsel for the defendant is asserting, no, there's medical reasons for that. We're not trying it, but it would otherwise also go to the strength uh, of the case, uh, of the state's case or the lack thereof in that in, in counsel's interpretation. Now, obviously, we're not here to conduct a mini trial. It would be limited to the circumstances as set forth in the bail reform law. What is your proffer as to what these three ring videos will reveal, sir? Well, Your Honor, um, in uh, Exhibit 5 and Exhibit 7, it will depict the defendant um, inserting his finger uh, without any catheter kit um, into uh, the uh, essentially the uh, victim or complaining witness's groin area and looking towards the door area. Um, the state submits that that depiction negates that there was a medical purpose for this. Um, and then if we were to go forward with Exhibit 8 and 9, 
uh, those observations would be confirmed by both an LPN and RN who were also responsible for the victim's care. That there was no reason for Vaseline to be in that area and that there's a specific method uh, for uh, using what in this case the complaining witness and the court would hear uh, is um, a straight catheter. It's inserted and then it's the person essentially urinates and then it's removed. So there is no instance of that in either of the videos. As it relates to Exhibit 6, it would depict um, uh, the defendant lifting the um, complaining witness's um, legs well above her waist and towards her forehead, then hearing a pop, and then going for uh, assistance uh, at that point. Okay, so that's the proffer is what, 5, 6, and 7, and you also included 8 and 9. Mr. Glassman, since we're talking about 8 and 9, any objection to 8 and 9? Yes, uh, we have two objections, uh, one to 8 and also one to 9, both of which um, are video interviews or statements um, given by uh, health care providers uh, to, the, uh, to the alleged victim. Both of these interviews were conducted by the New Jersey State Police. Both of these interviews contain um, a medical description of certain procedures, which obviously are beyond my, uh, my scope of, uh, of education uh, that need to be considered and evaluated. Both of these interviews contain facts that I would need to consult with the defendant about so that I could do effective cross-examination. Both of these interviews, if presented to the court, would be presented without the ability to cross-examine and to test the credibility of the information provided on these videos. So to admit this evidence would violate the defendant's Sixth Amendment right It also impact his right, um, obviously, to a fair hearing to the point where it would be so prejudicial as to, um, as to uh, create a problem um, going forward. So, um, yes, we have a strong objection to the admission of those videos. All right, uh, Mr. Remy, uh, we're talking about Exhibits 8 and 9, the two respective interviews. Do you have any response to what Mr. Glassman said, sir? Yes, Your Honor. Um, counsel is positing that um, there was a medical purpose for these examinations. Um, he can, <clears throat> when he posits that, he opens the door to these two interviews in that regard. Now, he's positing there was a medical, medical purpose to it. Uh, presumably, and obviously I don't know this, presumably after talking to uh, his client over the phone, and uh, other resources that are available to him. So uh, certainly they are relevant. Certainly they go to uh, negate defense claims that this case isn't strong um, and um, would otherwise be relevant uh, for the court to consider as strength of the case, nature and circumstances of the offense are, are relevant in that regard. I would also add, having listened to both of the interviews, um, as I'm sure counsel undoubtedly has, is there is, whenever it's, uh, there is any level of complexity, um, the trooper says, I'm not a nurse, can you explain that a little further? And the person explains that further. So there is that breakdown in that regard. Um, counsel has an opportunity to, to, to speak to his client via the phone and, and other resources, uh, even in light of the procedural objection he raised earlier. Um, but the, uh, the weight of the evidence does um, seem to at least um, bow in the um, state's favor uh, in light of the, um, of the, the um, proffer made by the defense against the admission of these exhibits. Judge, uh, let me right, add, let's, let me let's, just let's, 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 yeah, the, the facts, uh, the facts as, as they stand now um, have been stipulated to in terms of probable cause. The issue before the court is not um, the strength of the, of the state's case and the likelihood of a conviction down the road. The issue is whether or not there are conditions um, that can be put in place to preserve the safety of the public uh, and evaluate the other standards considering the detention issue. Um, so um, the real analysis here, these individuals are not necessary. Secondly, with regard to the comment about we're, what we're positing and what but that's the whole issue here. The state is positing a certain position, and uh, obviously we want to respond, and we should be equal uh, on an equal footing to, to posit both of our, our positions. That's the problem with these proceedings, is it's not equal. Um, the state has the ability to conduct its investigations, and we don't have the ability to have an attorney client privilege communication with a client. So that violates, in terms of um, the issue, the defendant's constitutional right to have effective uh, cross-examination on these points. So what I tried to do by stipulating to probable cause is to uh, preserve the integrity of the hearing by allowing these witnesses to give their opinions, which are expert opinions um, regarding the care of this individual, um, and to not have 
the ability to cross-examine them would leave the impression that the, that the state has won the positing war uh, while we, in fact, are fighting the war with one hand behind our back. All right, thank you. Let's move on. Um, five, six, seven, eight, and nine are still not decided. Let's uh, move on to the rest of the list. Uh, exhibit 10, letter from Dr. I assume uh, we're referring to a letter dated March 23rd, 2020 from Dr. Paola Leon, PhD. Is that that's the one, Mr. Mr. That's Mr. That's okay. right, uh, all right, Mr. Glassman, uh, any objection to S10? No, we have no objection. And the reason we have no objection is because that letter basically is uh, confirmation of what the what the alleged victim's medical condition is. So no, we have no okay. objection. All right, so S10 is in evidence without objection. Public safety assessment X, uh, um, uh, S11, that's the original public safety assessment or the earlier public safety assessment for um, uh, warrant number 91. Any objection, Mr. Glassman? No, sir. Okay, so S11 is in evidence. S12 is the uh, criminal history for the defendant, two pages. Uh, any objection to that, Mr. Glassman? No, sir. Okay, and S13 is the uh, second public safety assessment for um, uh, warrant number 93. That's the newer one. It was just run uh, yesterday, April 7th. Any objection to that one, sir? No, sir. Okay, so, so far, without objection, we have in evidence S1, uh, 2, 3, and 4, also 10, 11, 12, and 13. Um, the dispute is concerning uh, S5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. The court is not going to admit those exhibits. Uh, the court uh, notes that the uh, state has proffered what those exhibits uh, reveal. Uh, the court notes that uh, that's one reason. Second, and so it's very clear that, the, that, that the, those exhibits uh, have a strong indications as to the has indications as to the strength of the state's case, although, as pointed out by Mr. Glassman, those, some of those exhibits are subject to um, rebuttal and um, to be refuted, uh, but again, we're not trying the case. Um, reason number three, um, probable cause is stipulated, uh, and that's really all we need. Uh, and the defense can stipulate probable cause because the defense uh, is able to do that. And an argument that, well, we need to decide on stipulations beforehand, uh, I don't think that that's really the status of the law, but even if it is, it puts form over substance. The substance is that Mr. Glassman, representing his claim, has stipulated a probable cause. Um, reason number four is that the uh, S2, S4, and S10 uh, all give, uh, by themselves, in and of themselves, give the court uh, a well-grounded suspicion that uh, an offense or offenses have been committed. Um, probable cause, as we know, is a low standard. State v. Gibson, 218, New Jersey, 277, and 292, 2014. Um, probable cause calls for far less evidence than is needed to convict that trial. State v. Brown, 205, New Jersey, 133, at 144, 2011. Also see State v. Sullivan, State v. Burnett, State v. Walsh, State v. Kazabuki, and State v. Evers. Those are all New Jersey Supreme Court cases that establish probable cause. And in this case, S2, S4, and S10 do give the court sufficient probable cause, regardless of whether or not the defense is stipulating probable cause. But we have here uh, two pathways to finding probable cause. One, the court has found probable cause by those exhibits which actually are in evidence. And two, the court has um, uh, accepted the stipulation of probable cause, which, uh, by the way, happens routinely. Um, uh, there is one public defender who, in almost every case, he stipulates to probable cause, and um, and we never had a problem with that. Um, and uh, uh, so that's uh, that should not be uh, something uh, that's objected to or challenged uh, by the state. Um, as far as S five, six, seven, eight, and nine are concerned. Um, the court does not want to get into the slippery slope of trying the case. Um, we don't. We're not doing that today. We don't need to do that. Um, uh, the court does, uh, to a certain extent, accept the uh, concerns uh, of defense counsel not being able to um, have a proper. Um, preparation to refute, but simply they're not, for this type of hearing, they're just really not necessary. The court does uh, accept the proffers made by the prosecutor uh, that these are uh, formidable exhibits that uh, show um, culpability on behalf of the uh, defendant. 
Uh, those exhibits will come up at trial, no doubt. Um, they'll be challenged at trial. Uh, there'll be cross-examination at trial for the uh, interview uh, subjects, but the, uh, the court does not need to get into those issues right now. That's not what these hearings are about. So for those reasons, the court will uh, decline to admit S5, S6, S7, S8, S8. S9. Okay, so now that we have the exhibits, let us proceed uh, with the hearing. Uh, anything further from the state? Yes, Your Honor. As the court can see from Exhibit 1, uh, the complaint warrant sequence ending 91 in evidence, the defendant is charged by way of that complaint with aggravated sexual assault in the first degree, aggravated assault in the second degree, and endangering the welfare of a child in the second degree. Um, these do encompass no early release act offenses. <laughs> Um, that is relevant as pursuant to the bail reform statute in, in that the uh, defendant does face an extended term of imprisonment or at least a, a term of imprisonment in general as it relates to that. Um, we see uh, that the March 20th, 2020 incident uh, as shown through the affidavit of probable cause and this now goes to the strength of the uh, state's case and the defendant's exposure um, that um, the ring camera did uh, show the victim incapacitated, uh, as fully evidenced also by a letter from the uh, victim's doctor uh, being sexually assaulted by digital penetration. Um, and then uh, he lifts her legs on a essentially the same day, but a, a later incident, uh, well above her legs, hears a pop, uh, and then gets help at that instance. Now, I, I also would return to my earlier proffer as it relates to the ring video in that the defendant um, doesn't have a catheter kit, uh, doesn't, is looking towards um, uh, essentially the door at that point, um, and uh, there is no medical purpose to what he's doing in that regard. That goes, as I mentioned earlier, to the nature and circumstances of the offense, the strength of the state's case, as well as to the defendant's exposure. Now we see that that initial incident then um, allowed the state to uh, look at further evidence um, and from that further evidence, and this, this uh, investigation um, is ongoing, but what we have discovered is another incident dated uh, from January 24th, 2020, uh, Exhibit 3 charges uh, one nearer offense along with the endangering the welfare of a child for a January 24th incident. Um, it captures um, this, the, uh, again, uh, for no medical purpose, the defendant uh, digitally penetrating um, the incapacitated victim in this case. Um, and uh, as noted on the affidavit of probable cause, the defendant isn't performing any medical procedure on his victim, he, uh, such as inserting a catheter, uh, but rather is captured looking over his shoulder uh, towards the door to avoid detection. We then um, we then look at exhibits um, 11 through 13. Now I do recognize both public safety assessments rank this defendant as a 1-1. The defendant uh, in his criminal history has one prior shoplift which was dismissed um, and should be given low if, if any weight as it relates to that. But we see the recommendation is no release recommended due to near a charge. Now the reason behind that is the defendant's exposure. We have two separate incidents. The defendant faces consecutive jail time as it relates to those incidents and must serve at least 85% of any sentence uh, for it. Um, so the state is, is asking the court to look at the nature and the circumstances of the offense, the strength of the case through uh, as, as the affidavit of probable cause references and the plea references through video, uh, through, uh, through any testimony, through doctor's notes um, to show no medical purpose for his examinations uh, and uh, no reason for him to use sufficient force and pull her legs over uh, close to her forehead, um, thereby with sufficient force to cause her, uh, her femur to be broken. Um, now, yes, I, I, I conceded earlier the defendant has no prior history, uh, and we must balance the factors with the defendant's familiar ties, employment status, uh, community ties, uh, with the nature and seriousness of the offense, the strength of the case, and the exposure under NERA. Uh, because of uh, the three factors mentioned by the state, 
uh, the state posits the defendant's risk uh, to flee is high under these circumstances. Even before bail reform, we looked at, well, what is, is the defendant's exposure? And that didn't change under the uh, bail reform statute. We looked at, well, what is, what, what is the defendant facing if convicted? What is the strength of the state's case? Um, and um, and what, uh, how was this crime committed? And what danger does the defendant possess to the general community? Um, weighing those circumstances, we see um, that uh, there's, there's really no condition the court can craft to abate the fact that uh, the defendant does have that high exposure, does have every incentive to flee in that circumstance, um, and uh, that detention is proper. Now, um, I brought this up earlier, um, not only the bail reform statute, but I, I do want to clear up some confusion as, uh, confusion as it relates to the case of State versus SN found under 231 NJ497. Um, the court didn't hold that, listen, you know, you can look towards one factor and decide on that. The state is not asking you to do that. Um, the state is asking you to look at all the factors here. And all the factors, uh, when weighed, um, we see that detention is proper. There, the, in SN, um, the state put forth uh, essentially four exhibits. Uh, the public safety assessment, the criminal history, uh, the complaint warrant, the affidavit of probable cause. That's it. In this case, the state um, has, issued, has uh, given proffers um, as it relates to the additional evidence that show the case against this defendant is strong and that there is a high likelihood of conviction and therefore a high uh, risk of uh, exposure as it relates uh, to uh, this defendant. Um, and when balanced against the other factors, uh, it weighs in the state's favor. Um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, as it relates to the defendant's employment, I mean, it, essentially any, any uh, any person that would be this uh, defendant's patient would potentially be at risk, as there is a vulnerable patient base out there at this point. Um, and as an LPN, uh, there is, uh, you know, they typically work in, in areas with, with vulnerable population. Um, I'm not asking this court to, to rely on speculation, but rather uh, the exhibits in front of it as admitted into evidence in the proffer by the state. With all that consider, Judge, um, the patient in this instance, uh, the victim in this instance, uh, may not have a voice, but I'm asking the court to give it uh, a voice and to weigh the factors accordingly. And if the court does uh, and, uh, and weighs the factors uh, appropriately, uh, the state admits that detention is proper. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. Glassman. Your Honor, uh, I certainly uh, recognize the seriousness uh, of the charges alleged in the complaint and the fact that they're subject to the uh, No Early Release Act. Um, when the prosecutor uh, remarks that he's not asking the court to rely on speculation uh, in terms of the uh, facts of this case, um, I respectfully would disagree. Um, when we look at the evidence specifically um, that Your Honor has excluded, but the prosecutor has commented upon in terms of the strengths case, um, let me say for the record, I'm interested in only in the facts. For instance, um, the prosecutor has said that he used sufficient force to break the victim's humor. That's, uh, that's subject to an expert opinion. That particular conclusion um, is not readily apparent from watching the video. But what I'm concerned about is the facts uh, of the state's case and whether or not they actually constitute uh, criminal activity. That's one issue with regard to the femur. With regard to the other two um, allegations of sexual assault, um, obviously they 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 conclude uh, allegations of sexual penetration uh, by way of uh, using the individual's finger. So it's a digital case uh, and it's administered while other activity is going on in the room and while um, the defendant is performing uh, care for this particular individual. Um, the defendant gave a statement in this case indicating that that was exactly what he was doing. So again, with regard to the video evidence, uh, I would respectfully submit that the state is in no better position to conclude criminal activity than we are without the, uh, the use of an expert opinion that's tested uh, you know, by the framework of um, cross-examination and our ability to present our own expert. So that's, uh, that's our input with regard to the evidence that, uh, that the state calls strong. Um, again, 
we need an expert. And that's uh, readily apparent from this point, and it will remain the same throughout a jury trial. What we're here to do is decide whether or not the community can be protected from the defendant. Now, prior to this hearing, um, I made, I believe, two or three overtures to the prosecutor's office to uh, agree to any, and let me underscore the word, any conditions that would um, assure the safety of the public uh, and protect any other interests that the state would have in this bail reform equation. Um, both of those overtures or all of those overtures were rejected out of hand. Um, I don't know why they were rejected out of hand, much the same way I don't know why the prosecutor would take the position that this defendant poses a particular risk of flight. Um, the prosecutor's response is, I think, um, in couching his remarks, uh, is because of the amount of time that the defendant is facing. Um, routinely, in either state or federal court, you have individuals facing massive amount of uh, terms of incarceration where there's a bail um, or detention evaluation done, factors are considered, conditions are put in place, and the individual is allowed to function um, as best he can on the outside and including participate in the ability to frame a defense um, without being incarcerated at taxpayers' expense. Here, because of the virus, we have another, uh, another consideration. We have the burden uh, and the um, strain that this is going to continue to put um, on the Camden County Jail, as well as the correctional officers that work there. This is a thing that I think is relevant. And when we look at this offense and we weigh it against the risk, both to the defendant of contracting the virus, that there's an outbreak and the risk to the uh, other uh, expanding the jail population unnecessarily um, without a legitimate reason that is uh, articulated on the record. So um, my, uh, my position is that your honor can abide by the terms of the Bail Reform Act and do the equation that's required, whether or not by clear, clear and convincing evidence, Your Honor can find that we can preserve the safety of the public or conversely, that there's no, um, that there's no um, risk to the um, uh, public at large if we put certain conditions in place. So what do we have here before you? We have an individual who's 33, 33 years old. He's a practicing RN. He has absolutely no criminal history, including um, a risk of not appearing at court appearances, uh, violating other either uh, laws regarding public safety or criminal activity, nothing. We have nothing for the court to consider in weighing that equation. We have the fact that he's married. We have the fact that he also has a child who I believe is uh, is uh, 10 years old. So he's, he's an individual that's been working as a nurse since 2012. He's been, been employed at certain county correctional facilities um, I believe even Burlington County Correctional Facility between 2004 and 2005. If this wasn't a video proceeding in the courtroom, you would have a number of individuals from his family. I would count without naming them um, from his mother, sister-in-law, uncle, um, without naming him approximately 15 individuals who would be there to attest to their support um, on behalf of the defendant, but they'd also be there to, to uh, volunteer to supervise this defendant. As I speak now, the defendant's mother uh, is in a, in the, has the ability to supervise the defendant 24-7, uh, if, that, if, if that was uh, one of the court's condition. Um, Your Honor mentioned the safety and the protection of uh, the alleged victim here. Obviously, a stay away order works across this country. You have the most, uh, most egregious instances of domestic abuse possible, and a stay away order, as we can ask Nicole Simpson, uh, you know, didn't protect her, but that's what's used by the courts. We do the best we can. We can't protect everybody from everything. What we have to do is look at the risk factors and say, can we put conditions in place? All right, Mr. Glassman, but tell us what conditions you're talking about. Well, most notably a stay away order, most notably house arrest, most notably a bracelet, most notably supervision, most notably a landline. So um, routine calls can be made to check that he's on the premises. A, a, a self-quarantine or stay-at-home shelter-in-place order so he cannot go out with except express permission of pretrial services, the forfeiture of his passport, the inability to drive a car, take away his computer, and bar his cell phone. So basically what we're left with is him providing support for his wife, who's in the healthcare industry, working, I don't think she's working around the clock, but a good deal of time uh, as a, um, as a uh, individual on the front lines, and um, allow him to comfort his 10-year-old son in these diff difficult times, participate in the defense while eliminating any potential realistic 
realistic risk to the public. And um, I want to say, Your Honor, that routinely um, a prosecutor will say, well, there's a risk of flight or um, there is a risk that we can't safeguard this or there's a risk that we can't do this. Um, it's easy to say that there's a risk. The real question, and I can see that Your Honor performs this, this analysis, is what are the reasons that it's a risk? Well, here the prosecutor is saying, well, the reason is because this, this gentleman's exposure is astronomical, so there's a risk of flight. Well, number one, since the entire world is in lockdown, where is he going to go? But more important than that, obviously, looking at the character and history, we have no evidence that he would even have a thought to do that. He has secured counsel. He has given a statement showing his state of mind um, in regard to the criminal activity. And also, let me add that um, the evidence by the state will also include uh, includes these videos because there's a camera in the room, a camera that the defendant was aware of during each of these alleged instances of criminal activity. Let me also underscore the fact that um, when the femur incident occurs, and again, this is not counsel's opinion. This is a fact. Part of the state's probable cause, the defendant exited the room. He exited the room immediately, got the individual's father to come in, reported the incident, uh, and then uh, it went forward from there. This is immediate. Finally, yes, um, I believe in the statement of probable cause. The state grounds a lot of its um, state of mind on the part of the defendant uh, in terms of the fact that he was looking in the direction of the door during an incident of digital penetration. The state concludes that, in an opinion, him looking at the door is evidence of guilt, that he was trying to safeguard the fact that somebody would walk in and interrupt his activity or he could uh, abort it uh, in time. Let me also suggest, again, by way of fact, of opinion, not fact, um, a healthcare provider touching the intimate parts of a patient, as I understand uh, in my analysis, is pretty routine that they would look away while they're doing the mechanical aspects of the uh, of their job at hand. Uh, so again, the prosecutor is entitled to his opinion. The defense is entitled to our opinion. But this isn't about opinion. What, what we're looking for is risk factors that are realistic and conditions that are also realistic. And then at the end of the day, if there's a pool by clearly convincing evidence that Mr. Glassman, uh, I'm still concerned about the public or I'm concerned about this victim. Uh, let me underscore the use of the word any. Uh, any condition, what we're trying to do is get this felon out of the prison population, back into a, another safe, secure environment, uh, as well as preserve the integrity of the Bail Reform Act and eliminate any concerns that the state would have. That's where we are uh, in the analysis. And I would welcome, Your Honor, um, any questions that you have regarding any thought process um, we want to uh, put forward that is going to ensure the safety of the community or, or the victim, alleged victim. Thank you, Mr. Glassman. Any response, Mr. Remy? Yes, Your Honor. First of all, prior deliberations between defense counsel and the state as it relates to this matter are wholly irrelevant, and it's improper to mention them um, in this forum. I, I, I consider it... Well, and, and, Mr. and Mr. Remy, I, I, I agree with that principle. Um, I, the point taken from that merely is that the defense counsel is willing to agree to just about any condition of release, um, but I agree that it, um, the court will not consider that there were negotiations and negotiations did not um, result in any type of agreement, so you don't have to worry about that. Go ahead. We further see the next part of defense counsel's argument is, well, he, uh, the defense has doubts that it constitutes a criminal act, which is surprising in light of the fact that the defense uh, offered to stipulate and the court accepted that stipulation. Uh, based on that representation, the state would ask the court to consider uh, its earlier ruling as it relates to excluded evidence um, on the exhibits, uh, as counsel now has, has essentially made them wholly relevant, um, and the relevance outweighs the prejudicial value as it relates to this matter. Uh, before I proceed, Judge, um, do you want me to, to proceed with, with uh, the rest of my yeah, argument? Good. 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 Um, we also see that the uh, defense mentions the virus, uh, and he says, well, you know, earlier, well, the, the state is offering its opinion, and obviously it's an expert opinion. Now, first of all, as it relates to breaking bones, uh, common sense dictates that to break a bone uh, does require a sufficient amount of force. What that force exactly is in relation to a force amount uh, is obviously the subject of some level of, of expert opinion. Um, but then he also goes on to say, well, what if there's an outbreak in the jail? That relies on speculation. It also 
relies uh, on something that would, in, in his opinion, if we follow his reasoning, we're relying on an expert opinion. Now, the virus itself, Your Honor, the state submits is irrelevant as a potential factor. It's not found within the bail reform factors. It doesn't go to any of the bail reform factors as it relates to this determination. Um, and the court agrees. The court agrees with that argument. State v. Washington. The, uh, the, okay. the, so the court agrees with that argument, sir. The state and then it's come up many times. It's come up many times recently, particularly in uh, the uh, particularly in the context of uh, people uh, asking for the hearings to be reopened. I said the wrong case. State v. Williams, uh, 452 New Jersey Super 16 applies here. Appellate Division 2017. Go ahead, sir. We then see this, the uh, defense uh, posit, well, in federal court and state court, uh, defendants are routinely uh, released after an assessment is done. Here, an assessment was done, and despite the fact the defendant being a 1-1, we see that no release is recommended because of his exposure. Uh, of his exposure. Now, what's excluded from that public safety assessment, and the state is not just relying on one factor, but rather uh, at least three, if not more factors, and I'll go into an additional factor in just a moment, but based on then his argument, the analysis that was done by the state court says he's not to be released. Um, uh, is there any condition? Well, the, the defense posited he's a practicing nurse. Well, then there is a risk, Judge, because he then uh, poses a risk to his further patients as that regard. It, it, it's something that they would be entitled to know in that regard. And uh, then we have, well, his mom is willing to take custody of him. Well, if he violates a condition of his release, if he takes a flight, and despite counsel's assertion, the nation is not on lockdown. People are cautioned to stay away, but the airports are open. Uh, if, he, if he violates the conditions or if he flees, is the mom going to be criminally liable for his offenses? Is, is the mom subject to, to a contempt for not following with a court directive? It, it, that is not a workable condition in this instance. Um, uh, well, you know, there were stay away orders. Um, well, the problem with that is, is, well, you, counsel mentioned it. He's a practicing nurse. I don't know what's going on with, with the division of consumer, uh, consumer affairs and, and, and any board of nursing as it relates to his license. But if, if he, if he even goes next door and there's a vulnerable person there, there is that risk there. And that's not speculative based upon the video evidence, based upon the uh, other evidence in front of the court. Um, simply put, Judge, the, the, state, the state posits this, is that the nature and circumstance of the offense, the strength of the case, uh, in this case, the defendant's employment ties are, in, in point of fact, something to be weighed that the state submits to be in favor of the state. And the, the defendant's exposure, not just on one near offense, but on two near offenses for which he uh, faces consecutive sentences. Looking at these factors found in the bail reform statute and applying the case law, Judge, the state submits detention is, is proper. There's no condition that would abate all these concerns. And this isn't speculation, despite defense's uh, assertions. They are based on fact as found within the evidence in front of the court and common sense derived therefrom. All right, thank you, Mr. Remy. May I respond uh, with, regard, with a couple of points? Yes. Uh, first, when the prosecutor says that- and, and this, this is the final, these are the final words, because then the court will make its decision upon right. your conclusion of your remarks. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. When, uh, when the prosecutor says this isn't speculation, uh, the balance of his argument is any condition we offer to the uh, to, pr to protect the community as well as the alleged victim, the prosecutor then responds, well, if he does that, and well, if he does this, and if he does that, then it's not a valid or, or legitimate condition. Well, when you use the words, if somebody does something, that's, in my book, speculation. With regard to the comment about the defendant's license, what's happening with it, I can tell you what's happening with it. Um, if everything was normal, we would have received a, a, a notice that his license was immediately suspended and giving us, I believe, 25 or 35 days within which to attend a hearing to dispute uh, that particular conclusion. So his license um, is basically on Saturn. Uh, that's out of the equation. Finally, when I use the words 24 seven, bracelet, lockdown, home confinement, um, obviously implicit in that is that the defendant isn't going to return to work. He's going to be home unless he gets permission from pretrial services in some way, shape or form to do some life saving um, or medically necessary um, um, trip. So um, again, 
his potential um, criminal activity um, is restricted to his household, his family, his whereabouts are restricted. Everything is basically restricted. I, again, um, I'm not aware of any other condition that we can offer to this court to, to satisfy the equation. When the prosecutor says, well, the state, because of this analysis, says, well, he should be incarcerated. No, uh, I, I respectfully disagree with that conclusion. I think what the state is saying is that but for the fact that the defendant is charged with these these crimes, there's no reason on the planet why he shouldn't be he shouldn't be let out um, and not let out with conditions. Let out ROR. What, what we're all, what we're saying here is that and to meet the concern and meet what the state is saying because of the seriousness of the offense, we're saying that um, we can take away any legitimate risk factors and put conditions in place that overly protect any potential scenario that could be in place. Obviously, what the defense cannot do, just like in a domestic violence case, we can do everything we can, stopping short of the fact that a defendant hell-bent on committing a violent crime isn't going to get a shotgun and go to his uh, spouse's home and uh, and murder her because he's angry about a stay-away order. I, I, no matter how long we talk, uh, or I try to defend or, or try to get the defendant out. I can't eliminate the risk factor uh, of, of that particular unpredictable uh, act. So having said that, again, um, I want to say that the defendant is amenable to any reasonable, legitimate, um, uh, constitutional provisions to safeguard everybody in New Jersey. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, this is the uh, case of uh, Edmundo Di Piola. Mr. Di Piola um, has two uh, warrants, W-1020-91-0334 and W-1020-093-0334. On both of those warrants, the state has filed uh, a motion for pretrial detention, and we just had uh, the hearing. Um, the court previously has found a probable cause uh, for the offense uh, based fences based on exhibits S2, S4, and S10. The court, again, does have a well-grounded suspicion that the offenses have been committed, and we know that probable cause calls for far less evidence than is needed to convict at trial. And again, the court will state that uh, the court does have sufficient basis for the uh, probable cause for the well-grounded suspicion, considering only S2, S4, and S10, and that it is not necessary to bring into the equation for probable cause purposes S5, S6, S7, S8, S9. Regarding those exhibits, S5, S6, S7, S8, S9, uh, the court has accepted the proffer of the uh, prosecutor as to what those exhibits uh, uh, contain, and the court is um, uh, satisfied that there is uh, some uh, basis for the strength of the charge, and that's one of the things to be uh, considered. Um, the uh, court, uh, again, is uh, fearful for turning this matter into a, uh, a mini-trial or a determination of guilt or innocence beyond reasonable doubt, or even a hint of that, the defendant is presumed uh, innocent. In fact, the defendant has um, stipulated probable cause for purposes of this hearing only. The court wants to make it clear that that uh, does not waive or give up the defendant's right to be presumed innocent of any and all charges. And also, uh, the court wants to make it clear that the probable cause stipulation for today's purposes only is not to be used in any subsequent proceedings involving this defendant. So I just want to make the record clear uh, as to that stipulation. And again, uh, that those qualifications, uh, presumption of innocence, and not to have the stipulation of probable cause used um, in the future are uh, standard understandings as to uh, when someone stipulates as to probable cause. Um, the court will also, um, there, of course, the court will um, therefore uh, address the issue of whether or not the defendant should be detained. First of all, we know that this is not a presumption case, even though there's at least one first degree uh, charge um, that the defendant is charged with. Actually, there are two first degree charges, and there are three second degree charges. So the defendant is charged with very serious matters. This is not a presumption case. <coughs> um, and uh, so the court uh, has to uh, act or view the case with the defendant having the presumption of pretrial release. Um, and uh, the 
charges, although very serious, are not charges that the legislature has deemed to be ones where it, the burden shifts to the defendant to establish um, uh, by um, a preponderance of the evidence uh, that he should be released. We, we are not going through those proceedings today. Uh, the state has to establish by clear and convincing evidence that there are no conditions of release that would um, uh, ensure the defendant's appearance in court required the protection of the safety of other uh, persons or the community or that defendant would not obstruct or attempt to obstruct the criminal justice process. Let's talk about those three things. Uh, defendant's appearance in court required. The argument is that the defendant is charged with such serious uh, offenses and has such a high exposure uh, as to um, uh, incarceration that he would have an inherent incentive not to appear in court. Um, and of course, that point is good to a certain extent. But again, uh, the charges that this defendant has, first degree and second degree charges, are uh, not ones where the burden has shifted uh, and not ones where uh, the presumption has shifted so that um, stating that the defendant would not appear in court because of the charges with no other basis is uh, speculative. Um, we don't have any history of failure to appear. We don't have any statements or actions of the defendant um, that would indicate that he would uh, attempt to um, uh, not come to court. For example, uh, there's no situation where the defendant uh, ran from the police. I think he gave a statement to the police. There's no indication that the defendant um, uh, went into hiding, that the defendant had to be um, uh, sought after and arrested, uh, or that the defendant has any other uh, ties or connections with anyone in any faraway place. Nothing of that has been presented, um, and uh, the court would think that if any of those facts were known, they would uh, have been presented. So the defendant uh, appearance in court uh, appears to be um, uh, that, the, excuse me, the argument that the defendant would not appear in court uh, appears to be speculative and is just based on only on the, the um, degree and seriousness of the charges. Uh, similarly, uh, jumping to the third factor, the defendant would not obstruct or attempt to obstruct the criminal justice process. There is no indication that the defendant would do that, and any indication the defendant would do that is um, speculative. Uh, this defendant has no convictions for resisting, hindering, obstructing, or uh, fleeing from the police. Defend There's nothing in uh, the case here that indicates the defendant uh, was it at all oppositional or um, uh, defiant with law enforcement. The defendant has no history of such actions, um, and there's no suggestion that he would do that. So the court really cannot guess that the defendant would obstruct or attempt to obstruct the criminal justice process. Again, it would be a guess. It would be purely, purely speculative. So the, the focus then is on the protection of the safety of any other person or the uh, community. That is really uh, the uh, the consideration that the court has to raise. Is this defendant a danger to this victim? And also, is the defendant a danger to persons in the uh, community? Uh, the court is always concerned with the uh, nature and seriousness of uh, risk to uh, a, the community at large, and particularly uh, with this uh, defendant. Um, however, um, the court is satisfied that conditions of release can be established for this defendant um, and that uh, that would ensure the protection of the victim. I might have said defendant a minute ago, but ensure the protection of the victim and would ensure the uh, protection of the public at large. Um, the court uh, does not find that the state has met its burden of clear and convincing evidence that would uh, justify pretrial detention of this uh, defendant uh, and instead finds that um, the uh, that there are a, a, a combination of conditions that can be imposed on this defendant that would satisfy uh, safety uh, and other uh, concerns um, for uh, this entire situation. Uh, the reasons for that are as follows. First of all, um, it's not a presumption case, as indicated. Secondly, the public safety assessment scores are one and one. Uh, third, the defendant has no criminal history. He has one dismissed shoplifting charge from 2005. It's not a conviction. There's no failure to appear on that. Um, and that was a charge from Burlington Township. Mm -hmm. 
The charge is from October 4th, 2005, and the case was dismissed in 2009. During that time, there's no indication, it took a long time, I don't know why that happened, but uh, assuming the dates are correct, reported correctly, um, took over four years for the case to be resolved. At no time did the defendant fail to appear. But that's it, that's the whole uh, dismissed case, no criminal history. So obviously he's not on probation, he's not on parole, never has been, uh, and he's not on pretrial monitoring. He has no failures to appear. Um, also, he has steady employment, and the court will accept the proffer that he has a stable uh, residence. Um, the court uh, receives guidance in these matters from uh, appellate and Supreme Court decisions. Uh, this case is very close to State v. SN, as mentioned by the prosecutor, 231 New Jersey, 497, 2018 New Jersey Supreme Court case. This case is from January 30th, 2018. Uh, State VSN guides the trial court, such as this one, uh, to not base a detention uh, decision solely on the offense or offenses charged or on any unsupported conclusionary statements uh, regarding the defendant's uh, ability to appear in court or safety to the public or uh, obstructing criminal justice pro uh, uh, process. Instead, the trial court here is urged to consider only the defendant's characteristics as he stands before this court. As he stands before this court, we have some with, someone with no criminal record. We have someone uh, where there's no indication that he would flee, and we have someone with no indication that he would obstruct the criminal justice process. Um, in the SN case, Mr. SN case, um, was charged with acts allegedly committed against his stepdaughter of sexual assault. SN was charged with first degree aggravated sexual assault. He was also charged, uh, aggravated sexual assault with a person under the age of 13. He was also charged with fourth degree lewdness. He was also charged with second degree child endangerment. Um, and in support of the complaint warrant, the affidavit of probable cause uh, stated that the um, victim had uh, reported this uh, uh, sexual uh, abuse, sexual assault uh, that occurred while she was in the sixth and seventh grade. Um, and it appeared that the defendant, uh, Mr. SN, was charged with um, approximately 50 uh, separate assaults on this uh, minor child. Very serious offenses. Um, the defendant, Mr. SN, uh, received scores of one and one. The defendant, Mr. SN, uh, uh, at his pretrial detention hearing, um, had information presented by the state that Mr. SN was a serious risk that he would not appear in court uh, because um, uh, he was a flight risk since Mr. SN's biological mother and sister lived in Canada. Um, compare, and, and in that case, Mr. SN was detained. And ultimately, when reached the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court released Mr. SN. This is very uh, a similar uh, parallel set of facts here. In this case, this defendant is charged with um, uh, first degree sexual assault offenses. This defendant um, has a 1 1 just like Mr. SN on his public safety assessment. Uh, this defendant um, does not have any connections uh, that anyone is aware of to any place out of the uh, country. Uh, and in spite of the connection to Canada that Mr. SN has had, Mr. SN was released. So uh, the case is very, the cases are very, very close, and the court is compelled, uh, regardless of its feelings as to um, uh, emotionally into the case, the court is compelled to release uh, Mr. Um, uh, DiPiola based on uh, alone the um, uh, Supreme Court's guidance given in State v. SN. Um, so for all those reasons, the court is going to respectfully deny the state's motion. The court understands the state's concern and the seriousness of the uh, uh, charges. But uh, simply put, there's no indication that the, this defendant would flee other than speculation. There's no indication that the defendant would be uh, obstruct or attempt to obstruct the criminal justice process. And the court is confident that uh, strong pretrial uh, uh, monitoring uh, conditions, conditions of pretrial release should be, uh, can uh, be imposed and would would uh, protect this victim and would also protect the public at large. Um, all right, Mr. DiPaolo, our, 
Uh, have you listened to all of that, sir? Yes, Your Honor. All right, Mr. DePiola, here's what you should know. I'm going to tell you what your conditions of release are. Uh, you need to very strictly and uh, um, uh, conscientiously observe these conditions. As you are aware, this is a very high-profile case. The charges are serious. As I said before, you're presumed innocent of these charges unless you plead guilty. You're found guilty. That comes uh, later, uh, whatever happens. Um, you are um, uh, aware that the prosecutor has done his job, nothing personal. He's done a great job. He's tried very hard to the, have the court order that you be detained. The court has denied that motion. Uh, the prosecutor certainly, in doing his job, as he is very diligent and very good at what he does, will be monitoring your case. The prosecutor certainly will file a motion. If you violate conditions, the prosecutor will file a motion to ask the court to revoke your release. And I'm not saying this as a threat, sir. I'm saying this to you so that you know what's going on. Uh, I'm going to impose some very uh, strong conditions of your release. Um, you need to follow these conditions, every single one of them. Uh, and if you do not, uh, you'll be probably right back in court for a hearing. Uh, if the motion is filed to revoke your release. We will have a hearing. And the result of that hearing might be that you would be uh, detained. Uh, so you don't want that to happen, sir. You need to, uh, 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 again, follow these conditions. Are you with me so far, sir? Mr. DPL, did you hear what I said? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. You know what? Take a very slight step back. You might be um, uh, jamming up the mic, believe it or not. Okay. He was on mute for a moment. That's the reason why he was, we couldn't hear him. Okay. Okay, very good. All right, Mr. DePiello, here are the conditions of release. Please listen to them very carefully. They will be in writing to you. Uh, sir, first of all, you're not to commit any new offenses. Um, secondly, you're to attend all court appearances. Your next court appearance is uh, the date I gave you before, Wednesday, May 27th. 2020. Uh, that's going to be a 1.30 appearance, sir. You'll go to the 7th floor courtroom 7A of the Burlington County Courthouse. You know where that is, correct, sir? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, 1.30, and that is for a pre-indictment conference. If you miss that court date or any other court date, a warrant will be issued for your arrest. So you are not to move from your residence unless uh, you have approval from the court, unless there's a court order. I assume your address is 136 Daniels Avenue in Pemberton Township. Yes, Your Honor. Yeah. All right, who lives there, sir? Uh, myself, my spouse, and my son, Your Honor. Okay, son is age 10, did I hear? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, that's it? That's it? Uh, we have one tenant. We have one tenant in the Air Force, but he's currently deployed for six months, Your Honor. Okay, is that in a separate part of the residence? I'm sorry, Your Honor? Is, does the tenant live in a separate part of the residence? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, does the tenant have children? No, Your Honor. Okay. All right, uh, sir, you are not to move from that address unless you have by further order of the court. Uh, and you are released on monitoring level three plus home detention. So you're going to be home 24 seven. The only time you're not home is when you have to go to court uh, or if you have to report in person to pre-trial services. Monitoring level three is weekly reporting to pre-trial services. Normally that takes place in this way. Reporting in person the first week, by phone the second week, in person the third week, by phone the fourth week, and continuing to alternate in that manner. Uh, however, there's no in-person reporting currently due to the current uh, virus crisis, so uh, pre-trial services will instruct you as to exactly what you need to do. You should follow their direction as far as reporting and anything else. Um, uh, there may be some things that you're going to have to do with the reporting, but like I said, they'll let you know. So that's monitoring level three. The plus part, monitoring level three plus, is home detention. 24-7, every day, you are home, sir. You are ordered not to be employed in any fashion. Uh, and while you're home, you are ordered to uh, not to use the Internet for any reasons. Um, you are also ordered while you're home not to have contact with anyone under the age of 18, except your son, who lives with you. 
if you get a different tenant uh, from this Air Force person, uh, you're not to accept tenants who have children. You're not to have contact with anyone under 18 for any reason. That means other family members are not to visit you. Um, if there are children under 18, uh, they're to stay away from your home. Do you understand that, sir? Yes, Your Honor. All right, so the only person you're seeing having contact, to having contact with is your son, age 10. Sir, so you are to um, not be employed in any capacity, um, and you are to uh, actually uh, not to leave Burlington County for any reason, which means you're not leaving the state, you're not leaving the county. Uh, the only place you need to go is to Mount Holly to go to court or if it opens back up to pretrial services. Um, Sir, you are um, ordered to surrender your passport to your attorney, Mr. Glassman. You understand that, sir? Yes, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Glassman, as an officer of the court, will hold your passport. Uh, sir, you are not to have any contact with the victim. You're not to have any contact with the victim's family. You're not, you're not to have any... Can we get the uh, chatter in the background to go down in the jail, please? This is so important, and I want you to hear everything. Can we just, all right, well, we're going to be finishing two minutes here, so just please bear with me. Again, sir, you're not to have any contact with the victim, the victim's family. You're not to have contact with medical persons involved in this case. You're not to have contact with your former co-workers or anyone else associated with this case. Do you understand that, sir? Do you have to answer me, sir? Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Okay. I guess you're muted and I'm muted. Okay. Uh, so, what I mean by no contact, not in person, not by phone, not by text, not by internet, no email, no social media. You're also ordered not to write letters or notes. If any of those people, uh, anyone involved in the case, should contact you, I would be very uh, puzzled as to if that happened. But if uh, anybody contacts you, you're not to respond uh, in any fashion, and you can let your attorney know that you've received contact. Now, if your attorney needs to interview witnesses or reach out to people, he knows what to do, he knows how to handle it. Your attorney can can um, interview people or contact people uh, who are in, integral to the case as he sees fit. He can do that, but you can't. You understand the distinction, sir? Just shake your head yes or no. Yes, Your Honor. Shaking his head yes. Okay, good. Um, sir, you are to um, not possess firearms, uh, dangerous weapons, or destructive devices. Do you have a firearms purchaser ID card? Yes or yes, no? Yes, Your Honor. You do? You just render the firearms uh, purchase ID card to your attorney uh, as well. Uh, and you just render firearms to the uh, Pemberton Township Police. Do you have firearms in the house, sir? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, I direct uh, immediately uh, by, by the end of today, you call the police and surrender the firearms to them. Is that clear, sir? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, do you have any questions about these conditions, sir? No, Your Honor. Your Honor. All right. Uh, Mr. Uh, Glassman? Yes. Uh, actually, no. no. It, was, it, was, it was me, Judge. Uh, I'm the one responsible. Uh, I do apologize. Um, can the defendant also, can the court have the condition the defendant surrender his nursing license to be held by the defense and not be directed not to apply? Uh, even after surrendering his passport for any new passport or travel documents. All right. The first thing is I'm not going to, I've ordered the defendant not to be employed in any capacity for any reason. That includes nursing or any other reason. Um, and I'm uh, uh, also aware that the defendant may be facing um, administrative um, uh, procedures regarding his nursing license, and I don't want to uh, prejudice the defendant regarding those procedures by the uh, anyone trying to have him forfeit his license. Uh, indicate as part of the argument, well, he already the judge already ordered him to surrender the license. Uh, I don't want that to be a problem for the defendant in any administrative proceedings. Uh, I think the. Um, uh, indication that he uh, is not or the order and the condition that he's not to work in any capacity will cover uh, any nursing or any other work activities. Um, I will also though uh, order the defendant not to apply for a new passport um, and I think that's a, that's a reasonable uh, suggestion. 
Uh, anything further, uh, again, Mr. Prosecutor? And I'll go back to you, Mr. Glassman, in a minute. No, sure. Um, Your Honor, the, the state would ask for a stay until 3 p.m. of the uh, uh, order of release. Um, I think that's reasonable. Uh, if I hear uh, after consulting with my office that we're not going to do anything in this regard, then I will notify the court and counsel immediately. I'm, I'm not intending uh, to deprive uh, the, the defendant of, of any liberty interest here. Uh, I'm just looking for a mere stay until 3 o'clock. Uh, that way the state can get the court's order uh, when it's uploaded and uh, proceed accordingly. Um, so that, that, that would just be the state's application. I, I do appreciate the court's, um, uh, you know, decision in, in, in that regard and, and have great respect for the court in that regard. Judge, uh, with all due respect, uh, we would have to object to the state's application for a stay for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, the term expedited appellate process um, is not really the reality. Uh, in terms of trying to get appellate review on an on an emergency basis, um, there are strict uh, timeframes that have to be followed, all of which are going to result in further uh, delay and uh, incarceration of defendant. Num number two, Your Honor, there's no articulated reason as to um, any any, uh, any risk to the public with these conditions in place that there that there would be a need to continue the incarceration of the defendant. So the state has the resources to pursue an appeal of this decision if they want. And I can assure the state that there's people that are standing by all working from home with the appellate division that are ready to uh, take the issue up rather quickly without your honor taking the necessary step of delaying his release. Any response to that, Mr. Remy? Well, your honor, certainly the, the state has the uh, the right to the appellate process. And I, I think that uh, allowing a small stay until 3 p.m. So that the, the state can decide to avail itself of the process um, would be fair. The other reason the state wants to say that enforcement is to notify the Department of State uh, that there is a prohibition on this applying for passport, and we want to notify the Department of State appropriately. Uh, that would take me a, probably an hour's worth of paperwork and ensuring that another hour. Judge, uh, I'm, going to respectfully, I'm going to respectfully deny the motion for a stay. Mr. DiPiola has been placed on uh, pretrial monitoring with very strict conditions, and I'm confident that Mr. DiPiola will be uh, available if the appellate division reverses the court's uh, decision. Uh, the court is also denying the request for a stay because uh, the court finds that uh, the reversal of the decision based on the court's reliance on the Supreme Court decision in State v. SN, and for the other reasons are articulated is uh, very, very uh, uh, slim. The court also denies the stay uh, based on the fact that the court has found that Mr. DiPiola is not a flight risk uh, and, uh, and will be someone who is available um, uh, if the uh, order of today's court is reversed and that Mr. DiPiola would, uh, uh, there's nothing to indicate that he would not readily submit to uh, uh, arrest and would, uh, in fact, the court is confident that he would surrender himself uh, if he was required to uh, do so. So for those reasons, the court is going to respectfully deny the motion for the uh, stay. Uh, Mr. DiPiola shall be released with conditions as, uh, as um, ordered by the court. Judge. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Judge, this is Maureen Wardwell from Pretrial Services. Um, yes. So for PML3 clients, we're doing video reporting. Now, it says that he cannot use the internet. Does that exclude him from- Oh, okay. Okay, that, good point. Good point. Mr. Um, DiPiola? So I, I, I prohibited you from using the internet, but of course I neglected to, uh, re to uh, consider that you're gonna have to use the internet to report to pretrial services. That is the only exception, sir, that you are to uh, use the internet to comply with pretrial services reporting requirements. I appreciate that being pointed out. Also, I should point out another thing, sir. When you go to court, you're leaving your home. You're going directly to and from. You're not stopping at the store. You're not stopping to uh, buy anything. You're not stopping to get gas. You're not stopping to get food. You're not going through the drive through uh, Any of those things, sir, directly there and back. No other business conducted, sir. If you need to get food or any other supplies or anything else, you have family members that can do that for you, but you are not, you are going directly to and from. Is that clear, sir? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. 
All right. Anything else, anybody, before we move on to the next case? No, sure. Thank you. No, Your Honor. Uh, I, I do. Know that was the last Burlington County matter, I believe, Mr. Um, yes. Holmes, next. Am I excused until I either find Yes, it? sir. All right. Thank, Thank you, Your you Honor. Again, Thank Stay you. safe. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good luck. Please be careful, Mr. DPO. Okay. We're going to move on. Okay, I think we have the parties for our next uh, hearing, and we'll go right into it. Is that uh, Mr. Richard Hone? I'm here, Judge. Okay, that's you, Mr. Hone. Okay, good. Uh, I projected uh, 10 o'clock. It's now 11.22. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, it took a lot longer, but uh, we needed to do what we had to, we had to do there. So um, we're ready to proceed with the uh, state versus uh, Richard Hone case. The case is 20-607. Could I have appearances of counsel, please? Good morning, Judge Taylor. Just stand on behalf of the state. Good morning, Your Honor. Jennifer Gottschalk on behalf of Mr. Hone. <clears throat> okay, thank you. In this case, uh, case number 20-607, uh, complaint warrant W-2020-116-1506. This was apparently was a transfer case. There was an order, uh, an order to um, deny, deny, that denied uh, pretrial detention, released uh, the defendant on PML level two, um, and imposed certain conditions, um, and that was done on February twenty first, two thousand and twenty. A motion has been filed by uh, defense counsel to. Um, Modify the conditions of pretrial release. Is this contested or not contested um, by the state? It is contested, Judge. Okay. Um, so let's, we'll hear the motion then. Um, I think originally it was filed by Karen Feck, who was with the Public Defender's Office. Ms. Gottschall, are you uh, also appearing with the Public Defender's Office or um, are you now retained counsel? Uh, Your Honor, I'm appearing as full counsel for the Public Defender's Office. Okay, very good. And um, uh, what is the basis of your motion, please? Um, your Honor, um, the order that was entered by the court, and I actually have two things. I have the event sheet with the notations um, that indicate motion to detain denied, report to pretrial services in Toms River. My client resides in Ocean County. Confirm monitoring location with pretrial services. Inform pretrial services of updated address and the abbreviation NCWV or child. No contact with victim is how I read that. I believe that's what that means. Um, and so anyway, and then the conditions of release, uh, the written order also entered the same day, February 21st, um, indicate on page, and this this is, uh, okay, yeah, so on page three, um, it indicates um, in general, um, okay, uh, it's bullet point number one, two, three, four, uh, five, uh, shall abide by specified restrictions on personal association as follows, colon, child, N T dash H. Um, let me just correct that first. Um, the child's uh, initials are actually S, as in Stephen. Um, T dash H. Um, she's age five. Under any circumstances, regardless if there is any restraining order in effect. Um, so um, fundamentally, here's what's going on. Um, there was a temporary restraining order issued back in February against my client um, involving contact between, alleged contact between him and the victim who is um, ST-H's mother. Uh, my client and the uh, victim whose initials are NT, 
N as in Nancy T. Um, there was contact allegedly between them. A uh, hearing on the, on the temporary restraining order, the final restraining order hearing, was conducted last week, April 2nd, by the Honorable Angela White, White Dalton in Monmouth. She dismissed the restraining <laughs> order. And so my client, pro se, prepared his own motion uh, and filed it. Um, looks like he filed it that same day or the following day. So that would have been either on April 2nd or April 3rd. Um, that is one of the, mat, uh, the items that I uploaded to the system yesterday. And um, attached to that motion is the order of dismissal entered by Judge Dalton last week. Um, with the dismissal of that, um, he is seeking to have contact with his daughter, um, as he said he had before, um, by Skype, um, and possibly by direct contact. Um, for the court's information, and I, I had spoken earlier today to Ms. Toscano from the prosecutor's office, um, my client, I also uploaded to the system and also emailed to your secretary judge um, a screenshot uh, where apparently um, NT contacted my client and said um, that she wanted to know what would happen after today and to let her know uh, if this court is allowing contact. So apparently she seemed to be agreeing to further contact. Um, and also for the court's information, since I'm trying to be as informative as possible. Um, my client uh, indicated to me that there's supposed to be an FD hearing tomorrow uh, before Judge Aquaviva in Monmouth. Um, it is FD docket number, where did I put that piece of paper? Excuse me one second. 13-186-20, 13-186. Thank you, yes. Thank hmm? you sir. Um, I'm gonna ask you not to speak until I point at you, okay? Um, anyway, um, that matter is still scheduled for tomorrow before Judge Aquaviva. I called and spoke to um, a family court clerk in Monmouth. I called this morning to verify that. So um, it is still scheduled to be heard tomorrow unless things change. As we know, court schedules are changing hourly, daily, whatever, uh, but it is currently still scheduled. Um, so. Uh, anyway, um, the position we're taking is that facts have changed in this case, at least as far as the family court is concerned, at least as far as that restraining order that was in effect when uh, this court ruled back in February on the status of my client's uh, pretrial release. And so we're looking for an additional permission from this court, um, the criminal court here in Burlington, to allow my client to have contact with his daughter, um, and that's the basis of the motion. Thank you. A couple questions for you. Uh, you are saying that the only condition you want changed is to have contact with the daughter whose initials are S, uh, T dash H. You're not seeking contact uh, uh, with the uh, victim N T dash H. Is that correct? Well, uh, within. NT. Um, she's NT. The victim is NT. Okay. Um, oh, no, we're not. We're not looking for contact with her. That there's one little quirky thing in this case, however, and that is that um, apparently the contact there had been contact allowed between those parties, only to the extent of um, to, of the care of the child and um, setting up contact between my client and the child. Uh, she was the, the supervisor. And I know the state's going to go into this more. I believe, I'm sorry to speak for you, Ms. Toscano. Um, but, um, but that was the extent of the contact that was to be had. So, um, but it's important, we felt it was important for the court to know that uh, um, the, the uh, family division in in Monmouth found no basis to continue the restraining order uh, that had recently been filed by the victim. So, um, What type of contact are you su suggesting? I'm suggesting, um, 
I guess um, texting contact only between um, my client and the victim, the alleged victim, NT, um, only for purposes of setting up um, Skype um, between him and the five-year-old child. And then Skype only with the child? Skype only with the child, correct. All right. And the change in circumstance has to do with the restraining order being denied. Is that correct? correct? That is correct. Okay. And that, no other, there's been no other change in circumstance? No. Correct. And what is the um, status of the case? First of all, I, let me correct myself. I said defendant was on PML level two. That's absolutely incorrect. He's on PML level three. I just read it wrong. Uh, we all agree, and I'm sorry for that mistake. Um, what is the status of the case? Has the has, um, defendant had his uh, pre-indictment conference yet? Um, Your Honor, I got this case uh, on Monday, so I believe not. I believe nothing's uh, happened on the criminal case, but I'm, I'm taking that over from this tech. All right, and do you, do you know what the underlying charge or charges would be? I do. Um, there is... I'm pulling out my documents right now, Judge. Um, yeah, take your time. Thank you. Um, the present charges are a contempt. Um, it's a, a violation of a judicial order, a restraining order, and a harassment charge. The harassment looks like it's a petty DP, but the, um, the contempt charge is a fourth degree offense. All right. Anything more, Ms. Gottschall, before we uh, turn to the prosecutor? Nothing. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, bear with me one second, please. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything that's pertinent here. Um, yes, okay. Uh, I, thought, I thought it was worthwhile. Pre-indictment conference for Mr. Hone is, uh, Hone is uh, May 13th, Wednesday, May 13th Thank at 9 a.m. All right, appreciate uh, somebody sharing that information with me. So that, that's, that's the answer judge, to that. Is that Judge Covert or do we know? Yes, it'd be Judge Covert, courtroom 7A, Thank Wednesday, you. May 13th at 9 a.m. for pre-indictment conference. Okay, Ms. Toscano, your response, please. Yes, thank you, Judge. The contempt charge is not for the restraining order that was filed in connection with this case. It's actually a contempt charge against the permanent restraining order that was filed back in, believe, I believe, 2016 in Monmouth County. Um, it is a permanent restraining order relating to a stalking charge that the defendant uh, uh, picked up and was sentenced on. Um, with regards who to... Is the, who, is, who, is the, who is the victim in that uh, restraining order? The present victim. A and, and yes. Okay. So... This from 2016, and it was dismissed by Judge Dalton on um, April the 2nd? No, Judge. This would be a uh, no. criminal restraining order rather than a family restraining order. That family re restraining order, I will concede, was dismissed, but that permanent restraining order in the criminal division in Monmouth County still stands, and he is not to have any contact with the victim. Um, with regards to any contact with the wait, child, wait, wait. Yeah, hold, hold on one second, because uh, it's probably, I'm, I'm just confused here. So 2016, he's, he's ordered not to have contact with NT, and then he's, there's another restraining order in 2020 where he's not to have contact with NT and the five-year-old, and um, that's the, the new one was dismissed, but there's still no contact with uh, NT from three or four years ago. Is that is that the correct the way to look at this? Yes, Judge, and I apologize. It's actually August 2017. Um, 17, okay. 2016 case, but yes, you are correct. Okay, all right, go ahead. Uh, with regards to the release or release order, uh, the detention hearing judge did consider whether there would be a uh, restraining order in this case, and the wording states, child, it should be S-T-H-H-5, under any, he's supposed to restrict any personal association with that child under any circumstances, regardless of if, if there is a restraining order in effect. So that detention hearing judge considered if there would be a restraining order uh, addressing any type of parenting time issue and said, regardless of whether that is dismissed, he should still not have contact with the child. So I don't think that the restraining order should have any bearing on your decision today. Uh, and, and I don't believe it would be a changed circumstance. Additionally, 
the defendant wants to direct contact with the child, but quite frankly, I don't believe that this court should be addressing any type of parenting type issue, and I believe this motion would be more appropriate for the FD judge hearing, hearing the matter tomorrow. Um, it's also concerning um, the victim did contact the defendant with regards to parenting time, uh, and I believe defense counsel did uh, send that to your honor, and it does state, let me know when you get a modified court order from Burlington County, which allows contact to resume. I did speak with her today. That was not any type of, uh, she does not want to continue parenting time. It was more, let me know if something changes. She does not want any contact with this defendant. She does not want her daughter to have any contact with this defendant. Um, she is significant concern for her safety, and this defendant has shown an inability to comply with any court conditions, as shown from uh, his various charges. He just got out of state prison for stalking this defendant and a contempt charge, and near days, if not weeks later, he is now contacting her again. So I understand that he does want contact with his daughter, but the more appropriate venue would be a motion in family court. Well, um, if the court does not uh, grant the request for him to have contact with the daughter, does it, isn't that dispositive on the uh, FD family uh, court judge? Can you say that one more time, Judge? You broke up a little bit. Is it, if the court if the court orders uh, no contact, doesn't that uh, isn't that dispositive on the FD hearing that's scheduled? Yes, Judge. But actually, the permanent restraining order, there's a paragraph that states in this paragraph two, any issues relating to the party's child uh, sh shall be controlled by the family court. So I would agree to some type of order saying that they can have contact with regards to the child pursuant to a family court order, but it should not be uh, contact for whatever he wants or contact with the child. I don't think that should be permitted in the order. Can I speak? Yes. <laughs> No, I have sir. To. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Sir. Do not speak. Nobody knows what they're talking about, <laughs> except me. That's not what they want. Um, 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 sir, if you're going to persist on speaking, I'm going to ask whoever is the host of this session to uh, just hang up hang up on you. So you say one more word, sir, I'm going to direct that uh, the uh, uh, session be terminated for you. Getting back to the prosecutor, Mr. Scanner. Um, if the if the FD uh, judge orders contact, doesn't that eviscerate the condition of um, uh, that uh, of release regarding contact? Seems that we could be working at cross purposes here with two different judges. I understand, Judge. I think we're we're putting the the car before the horse. If the FD judge did order that, I think that's the more appropriate time for the defendant to come back and say. Uh, the FD judge ordered that I can have contact with my child. Parenting time is appropriate. Uh, and then your honor can, I would ask your honor to change the order then. <clears throat> and your All honor. Right. Um, All right. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Gatcho, any response? Uh, yes, thank you, judge. Um, I believe just the opposite should happen. I think for the FD judge tomorrow to make, um, to make a, a true dispositive decision about whether or not there should be contact between my client and the child, um, this court needs to have lifted the criminal restraint. And that's why we are here today doing this. Uh, we're asking that this court lift the restraint, but even, even by doing so, there's still the other restraint in place. And since there is a hearing scheduled tomorrow or very soon, even if it doesn't happen tomorrow, I, I suspect it will happen very soon, um, then the FD judge can make a, a decision about uh, whether contact between my client and the child is appropriate and the conditions thereof. But at this point, it seems to me that the only reason that this uh, criminal um, that this court had rendered a decision to have no con for my client client to have no contact with the child was simply based on the present charge. It really didn't have anything to do with the uh, permanent restraining order that was entered by Judge Justice back in 2017 in Monmouth. So I'm asking that the the court here today lift the order that had re had restrained my client from having contact with his daughter. And even by doing so, it doesn't mean that he will be able to do that yet uh, because of the existence of the other order. But then give it over to Judge Aquaviva tomorrow, whenever, 
and let him make a decision about how that will go forward. All right, thank you. Any final words, Mr. Scanner? Judge, the only thing I would ask is if Your Honor is inclined to grant uh, contact with the child, that it be pursuant to Emily, any family court order, uh, which is consistent with the permanent restraining order. All right, thank you. In this case, the defendant has uh, filed a motion to modify conditions of release, uh, focusing only on uh, having the defendant to be able to have contact with the uh, daughter, whose initials are S. T-H. Defendant is restricted and, uh, in fact, ordered uh, not to have contact with the mother, uh, N-T, and the um, child is five years old. The proposal is that the um, defendant would text the, the mother to set up a uh, Skype session and then would Skype only with the child. Obviously, the child is five years old and would not be able to do either of those, although I guess five-year-olds can surprise you sometimes, but uh, the court will, will uh, uh, for the purposes of, of this hearing, uh, indicate that the five-year-old would need parental, in other words, the mother's assistance to um, uh, set up an avenue of communication with the um, uh, defendant. The reason given for the change is that the restraining order uh, was denied by Judge uh, Dalton on April 2nd, 2020. And that is the only change in uh, circumstance. Um, the defendant still has the original uh, charge of violating domestic violence restraining order, and the court will accept the proffer that the uh, mother, um, to a large extent, is still um, uh, still has the restraining order from 2017 in effect uh, and um, that the defendant um, does pose a risk or danger to the mother NT. Um, the court is going to respectfully deny the motion. Um, we, uh, the court is concerned with contact with NT uh, and that the court would um, uh, be uh, the court is concerned that the defendant in, in texting with NT would therefore have contact with her uh, with the uh, pretense that it's to set up uh, communication with the child. Um, the court uh, is concerned that that uh, contact would go beyond the scope of what it's supposed to be. The defendant would not be able to uh, control himself. He can't control himself in the hearing when he's alone in his home with the judge and the two attorneys. Uh, he has to speak out. So that, that, that speaks volumes right there. But to separate and apart from that, um, the order is no contact with the victim, NT. And to have uh, an exception to that would pretty much uh, swallow the whole no contact provision to a great extent. Um, the primary concern in these cases in releasing people is the protection of the safety of all, including the victim. Uh, in this case, the judge who uh, released Mr. Um, Hone on monitoring level three uh, did so with the condition that the um, uh, that the 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 um, defendant should abide by restricted specified restrictions on association with the child, regardless of if there was a restraining order or not. And the only thing that's changed is that uh, the restraining order was uh, dismissed, um, but there is still the one from 2017. Um, uh, this, this is not enough of a reason to allow contact. The overriding, although it would be good for this defendant, I'm sure he misses the five-year-old very much, um, this would be a way for the defendant to sort of circumvent the no contact with NT and, in fact, have contact with her. Uh, it would be free range. Uh, there would be no assurance of, of any, uh, that there would not be anything improper, and the court will therefore um, uh, deny the motion for those reasons. Um, Again, the pre indictment conference date is May 13th at 9 a.m. And um, uh, thank you for um, your participation in the proceedings. I think that's all, we'll, uh, that's all we have for today. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Good luck to you, Mr. Hone. Uh,